again we thank you all for being here this evening the first deck first item this evening is public comments or requests i have three cards up here and the first one is patty olson who is a parent Ms. olson come on forward thank you my name is again patty olson i reside in Merrill's inlet and i have three sons in the school system thank you to the board for your service tonight i'm going to focus on the fear mongering and propaganda that surrounds us and focusing on facts over fear dr anthony Fauci said in email correspondence last year that face masks aren't needed unless an individual was sick and that the coronavirus was able to pass through personal face masks easily he said, and I quote, masks are really for infected people to prevent them from spreading infection to people who are not infected rather than protecting uninfected people from acquiring infection. The typical mask you buy in the drugstore is not really effective in keeping out the virus, which is small enough to pass through the material. Fauci concluded saying, I do not recommend that you wear a face mask to travel by air. Now let's talk science. N95 masks, the mother of all commercially available masks, blocks out anything 0.3 microns and larger. The COVID virus is 0.125 microns. So even wearing the N95 mask, which is very hard to breathe through, needs to be custom fitted and changed hourly, will not do anything to stop the virus. All these drugstore masks are, all they're doing is trapping bacteria, pathogens, and germs, and provide zero protection once wet. Masks are useless. Let's also talk about a recent Zoom meeting from a hospital in North Carolina with Dr. Mary Rudick and Carolyn Fisher discussing inflating COVID numbers by counting recovered patients as active COVID patients. We need, to, we need to be more scary to the public. If you don't get vaccinated, you know you're going to die. She then proposed including patients she characterizes as post-COVID in the hospital's case count, the primary source of the outrage, which has been on social media. This fear mongering is widespread and it's happening everywhere. I would also like to speak about the vaccine as the pharmaceutical companies are seeking approval for ages five through 11. Again, these, this needs to be remain a choice since vaccinated people can get and pass the infection to other vaccinated and unvaccinated people. Nothing about this is about safety. And after all, if you are vaccinated, then you should have nothing to worry about. One more word about science. What kind of science forgets to do long-term studies for five to 11 year olds, 12 to 17 year olds, 18 to 99 year olds for the entire world. And finally, a word about those that are apprehensive to send their children to school. I agree that we need choice. I am asking for the expansion of virtual learning to afford many others the opportunity to learn at home. A solution would be to live cast classes to students at home on virtual learning and that would afford those at home quarantining the ability to stay up to speed. Please keep parental choice in our schools. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Olson. We appreciate that. The next card I have is from Sylvia West, who is an employee. start. I've never had to do something like this before. I hope I have been an employee for the Georgetown County School District now for 14 years and I've never had to deal with the problems that we've had in the past three years. It's really been a hard job for everyone. I know things has changed but I am here today speaking for the cafeteria workers. I work at Rosemary Middle School Cafeteria in Andrews and it's like our job has turned upside down. We've had to fix bag lunches. We've had to give them out outside of the cafeteria to the parents. Sometimes three breakfasts, three lunches, sometimes five breakfasts or five lunches. Had to stand outside in the cold, the heat, the rain, it didn't matter, but we had to stand it and bear with it so we could make sure the kids were getting their food. But we were still working and doing the job on the inside. 
we had to fix lunches and put them in carry out trays, carry them down the hall to the classrooms for lunch and for breakfast. And if we run out and come to short, we had to go back to the cafeteria, refill our bogies, and go back down the hall again. They're still having to fix back lunches. Some afternoons we had to stay on Wednesdays from 2 to 4 in the afternoon to give out back lunches. And we did this while we were still serving regular lunch. It may not seem like much to some people, but it is a lot when you have never had to do something like this before. It's hard whenever some of our workers have quit and we've had no replacements. Some of them just don't want to work because of the things we're having to do. So that puts double work on the ones that are there. We had to change from in cafeteria only to down the halls outside, fixing bags, carrying bags, and now nothing for this. Some cafeterias or some counties have given their cafeteria workers bonuses for the extra work that they've had to do. We have not received anything. Some counties give their cafeteria workers one uniform and one pair of shoes at the beginning of each year. We've received two chef shirts and one pair of shoes. I just feel like we should be showed some type of appreciation for the hard work that we do. I'm sorry if I took up too much of your time for this, but I feel like someone needed to speak out for us and the job that we do and the changes that we have had to make. But no matter what we've had to do or where we've had to do it, we still make sure that the kids are being fed. Thank y'all very much. Thank you, Ms. West. You, you certainly did not take up too much time. I appreciate your comments. We all appreciate your comments and we appreciate your hard work. The last card I have is from Ms. Nicole Isaiah, who is also a parent. I hope I pronounced your name properly. Isaiah, very close. Close, close yes. cigar. Hi, I'm Nicole Isaiah. I'm a clinician, scientist, and I've worked in many hospitals and universities, including Stanford University School of Medicine, prior to relocating here with my family. I have two young children in the school district. Um, more kids are getting infected with the Delta variant, but what we need to remember is that Delta is more transmissible, but kids are not getting sicker with Delta. The risk of hospitalization and death in children is still very low, lower than the risk with the flu virus. On August 26, 2021, the risk of child hospitalization was 0.9% and child deaths were 0.01%. Let's compare this with August 27, 2020, where hospitalization risk was 2.1% and death was 0.02%. The Delta variant is more transmissible but is weaker, and we're seeing this in lower risk of hospitalization and death. Asymptomatic and mild child COVID cases are underreported. AAP data says there's an unknown number of ch children infected but not tested or confirmed. Up to 99.2 of children may have asymptomatic or mild disease. If all pediatric COVID-19 data infections were included in the data, the risk of child hospitalizations and death would be even lower than the already low risk reported. No current data shows that Delta is more serious for children according to the NIH director, Dr. Francis Collins. At my daughter's recent hospitalization, there were numerous open beds on each floor, and I discussed this with a nurse who explained that the patient load is the same, but they're understaffed and cannot open these beds. Our hospitals are not overwhelmed, they're understaffed. Our, my daughter was just hospitalized, and at intake, they took her oxygen and sat, her oxygen sat levels, and they were 82% with her mask, and they jumped up to 99% when the mask was removed. The nurse said that this was normal for oxygen saturation levels to be so low with the mask on. This is a concern. There are multiple scientific studies detailing low oxygen levels, increased carbon dioxide levels, and the resultant health effects of prolonged mask use in both children and adults. One study found that children had carbon dioxide levels above acceptable levels. Another found that oxygen levels were so low that it was causing headaches, fatigue, and other symptoms. 
what are the long-term effects on our children if they're forced to wear masks for multiple hours a day for another year? Who will be liable for forcing these masks on our children if there are negative effects down the road? I want to know what the impact is going to be on their development and their lung capacity. We know that masks are not effective. Michael Osterholm, an epidemiologist at Biden's COVID task force, said that cloth masks that people wear are not effective in reducing any of the virus moving in and out. We need smart, science-backed guidance. Masks should be a family choice and in no way push the savior from COVID. We need policy based on facts and not fear. Children ages 5 through 14 are more likely to die from cancer, accidents, suicide, homicide, cardiac disease, drowning, suffocation, and flu than COVID. Their risk of long-term COVID is minuscule. In addition, children are more likely to suffer serious illness as a result of the flu, three times the risk, than, and suicide and mental illness in youth are on the rise. Let's look more closely at that. I personally have had a lot more clients with anxiety and suicidal ideation as it relates, as it relates to mask use and isolation from their peers. Um, another issue of concern is the, um, I'm noticing that vaccinated individuals are required to quarantine after close contact, but we know that vaccinated individuals have over 200 times the viral load compared to the unvaccinated. They can still spread, and if we want to slow the spread, we need to quarantine all close contacts. Jose? Sorry? I appreciate your oh, comments. Oh, my time. Okay. Your time. All right. Well, thank you for your time, everyone. I appreciate thank it. Thank you very okay. much. We appreciate your comments. That was the last card I had, but if anybody else would like to address the board at this time, they certainly may. <laughs> please state your name and where you're from, please, sir. Good evening. I'm Marvin Deal, president of the NAACP Georgetown branch, second vice president of the state of South Carolina. I came here to speak tonight, but I didn't put up a card. But after the young lady spoke about the cafeteria situation, uh, I came here to speak about that tonight. But I held off that I was going to meet with uh, Mr. Price next week sometime if he had time on the schedule. But it burns my heart to sit and listen to her. And, and I listened during the campaign season. And we have spoke about the uh, livable wages for these cafeteria workers and the challenges that go through. And we constantly talk about that. And we constantly see the same people get raises. The six-figure folks get the raise. There's no reason why we cannot take care of cafeteria workers, these bus drivers, and these, these uh, uh, custodians in the school. You know, we have to do better than the campaign and really do what we say we want to do and take care of people. $7.25 an hour that's, that's South Carolina governor's mess. We don't have to do that in Georgetown. We still have people with 15 to 17 years still trying to get to $15 an hour bus drivers. And they were bus driver of the year and everything else. I guess that includes all the incentive and bonuses and everything that came with it. A bonus is nice, but that don't set you up to pay rent from day to day. A bonus is something that's given as a gift. As Santa Claus would show up and just throw your bag. These people need livable wages. They're in worse shape than we were. I spent 21 years in the military, and I've never seen people suffer so much and have to endure so much and paid so little. It is shameful. And I, I really feel bad about it because it's shameful. It is shameful. The bus drivers, cafeteria workers, and those that's under $15 an hour, it is shameful. We need to really fix that. I don't like to talk about it a lot, and I think we have some excellent board members, the superintendent, the staff. I think we need to fix that, you know, because that's a challenge. And talking about COVID-19, anyone that feels as though COVID-19 or Delta virus is a joke, visit the hospital. Just walk through that door. We don't have to talk to Dr. Fauci. We don't have to talk to anyone. Just walk through that door and talk to those nurses and those doctors that go through. They'll tell the story. God bless you and thank you for your time. I'll save you 20 seconds. <laughs> thank you. Every 20 seconds is important. Is there anybody else who would like to address the board at this time? All right, then we'll move on then to approval of the minutes. You received in your packet minutes from our meeting of September 7th, 2021. Unless there's any additions or corrections to those minutes, I'll entertain a motion to approve them as presented. 
So moved. Second. And properly moved and seconded that we approve the minutes from our meeting of September 7, 2021 as presented. Is there any discussion? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed, no. The minutes have been approved. Next up is adoption of the agenda. You've had a chance to look that over. There is an updated personnel list in the, on the agenda. Understanding that, do I hear a motion to approve the agenda as presented? Second. It's been properly moved and seconded. Do we approve the agenda as presented? Is there any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed, no. The agenda has been approved and the first action item is personnel list. Mr. Jenkins, is there any need to approve or is there any need to address us? Okay, the administration recommends approval of the personnel list as presented. Do I hear a motion? I've got a question. Yes, sir. And I ask this question all the time with, um, with all due respect. What does that say retirement? What does that mean? Good evening, members of the board, Mr. Price, district staff and guests. If it is retirement, uh, then essentially that means that they have submitted a letter of retirement and they meet one of the three criteria. Either they are age 62 with five years, 25 years at 55 years of age, or have completed 28 years of experience. Mr. Jenkins, I, I understand that. I, I guess I didn't rephrase, I did not phrase my question correctly. Yes. The folks that have retirement next to their name, are they going home or are they coming back to work? In reference to uh, B, yeah, those would be for Ms. Milton. Good evening, board members, Mr. Price. Um, in reference to B1, um, that was earlier retirement from a couple years ago. So that person has submitted an official letter saying that they're leaving. They're, reti they're retired actually on the Terry program, so they've already been retired. This is an official letter saying they're now leaving their position. I said, and again, it's not anything personal against anyone. It means that they're going home, is that, is that it? That's my understanding. Okay. That's all I asked, I just wanted to make sure. <coughs> all right. And properly moved and seconded. Do we approve the personnel list as presented? Is there any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed, no. It's been approved. The next action item is approval of a contract award to WM Building Envelope Consultants for replacement of roofs at Maryville Elementary, Plantersville Elementary, and Pleasant Hill Elementary School. Mr. Bob Sabiri, do you need to address us concerning this? <clears throat> Chairman Dunn, Mr. Price, the members of the board, I don't have anything to present on it. I think the facts are all there. If you have any questions, I'm more than happy to answer any questions. We have had a chance to look it over. The administration recommends approval of the contract award to WM Building Envelope Consultants for roof replacement at Maryville Elementary, Plantersville Elementary, and Pleasant Hill Elementary as presented. The design cost of these projects is respectfully, respectively $55,000, and $41,000. <coughs> Do I hear a motion to approve? So moved. Second. It's been properly moved and seconded. Do we approve the contract awards? Is there any discussion? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed, no. Thank you, Mr. Bob. Next action item is monetary incentive for vaccinated employees. Ms. Lindsay Ann. Good evening, Chairman Dunn, members of the board, Mr. Price. Um, you definitely have the, the B team up here this morning. I believe Ms. Johnson is, is out this afternoon. Excuse me, Ms. Johnson, I think, is out. So um, I'll be presenting on her behalf. But um, as we discussed at the last meeting, we had um, a proposal, and then this week it's in front of you for a formal vote. 
for a vaccine incentive program for employees. Um, and the way it would work would be that um, employees who have either already been vaccinated or who get vaccinated, um, either receiving both shots of the Pfizer or Moderna or the one shot of the Johnson & Johnson vaccines, if all that happens by November 12th, um, the employees would submit a copy of their vaccination card to a secure server that, that Dr. Powell has created for us. Um, and they would then receive for full-time employees, $250 minus taxes, part-time and temporary employees who work at least 10 days or 75 hours between the start of the school year, July 1 and November 12th of 2021 would receive $150 minus taxes. And then um, we also um, put in here that substitute employees vaccinated against COVID would receive $100 minus taxes. And it's my understanding um, that we would not be permitted to use ESSER funds to pay the substitute employees, but that uh, Ms. Johnson feels confident that we have money available and other resources um, to, to compensate those, that kind of handful of substitute employees that are out there um, since it's not that large of a number. Um, these payments would be issued before the winter break. Um, and we've put um, kind of together a, a timeline of if you haven't gotten your vaccination yet, um, when you should get it considering the, the three week or four week gap between um, the, the different vaccines that you would have to have. So we would um, publicize this to the employees, make sure that everybody was aware of it. Um, Dr. Paul has also created a, um, an email address that some folks in the human resources department would have access to, to assist employees with the process um, and to answer questions that, that may pop up. Um, and we, we believe that we've um, addressed all of the, the kind of um, detail-oriented pieces here. Um, so now it's, it's just to, to determine whether you all are in favor of it or not. I'm happy to answer any questions as well. Do we have any idea how many folks have already been vaccinated? No, sir, not to my knowledge. Um, as as we've kind of worried about before, the only time when we've been able to, to legally ask them, um, in, in most cases, um, is when they've been subject to a potential quarantine. So we haven't had the opportunity yet to, to ask, to require the information. We could have asked for it voluntarily, but we haven't done so yet. Um, I have a question. Staff members, will be paid and temporary and temporary part-time employees be paid from ESSER funds is that correct no no yes. Mm -hmm. yes. full full-time full -time. and temporary and part-time would be paid from ESSER funds substitutes who are employed through kelly services and that's our classroom substitutes not our um, custodial or uh cafeteria worker substitutes i think those are on our payroll um but but those that, that group of classroom substitutes would not be paid through ESSER funds. They would be paid through a separate pot of money. Where, what pot of money would that be? That is such a great question for Lisa Johnson. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would love to know that, you know, because, you know, can our, will it become, if it does come from general funds budget, where would it come from in general funds budget? My understanding is uh, that there is an, I'm going to touch on this in just a moment, but we have enough that we've been able to contribute to our fund balance that we could cover the small amount for substitutes that we can't cover with ESSER that we can cover with that. Okay. But we didn't want to leave those employees out, even though they're technically not our employees. They have uh, provided a tremendous service to us, and we need them in order to keep our schools operating as effectively as possible. Any other questions? The administration recommends approval of the monetary incentive for vaccinated employees as presented. Do I hear a motion for approval? So moved. It's been properly moved and seconded. If we approve the incentive, is there any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed, no. It's been approved. Thank you, Ms. Thompson. Thank you. The hard work pays off employee bonus. That will be me, Mr. Dunn. So uh, good evening, everyone. Um, when we began this year, we began with our motto of hard work pays off. And our commitment, our drive, and our focus was prepared to turn our, our attention to helping students with unfinished learning. We knew that we had a lot of ground that we needed to make up, and we were ready to roll up our sleeves and get to business. 
and over the first couple of weeks of school we were working hard but it was in a different direction than what we had intentionally planned um, as Ms. West mentioned earlier, our cafeteria workers have been doing uh, extra duties in order to serve our students. Not only that, but some work at one school for breakfast and then transition to another school for lunch because of quarantine situations. We've had clerical staff that have been um, covering classrooms because we were short teachers or substitutes. We have teachers who are giving up planning periods to help cover classes because we're short. We have drivers who are running extra, driving extra routes because we have uh, other drivers who are in quarantine. And, and I hate to start listing specific positions, but we've got so many different employees who are doing so many different things because of the challenges that are before us because of COVID. Last year, many districts uh, around us and throughout the state were awarding teachers bonuses and employees bonuses. And we were hesitant because, as you may recall, our school district had a significant decline in student enrollment. And when we have a decline in student enrollment, that impacts our funding that we receive from the state. So in order to be extra conservative to make sure that we could get through our school year uh, effectively and efficiently, we, we remain very conservative. Um, throughout the year, we were able to finalize the books for our 2019-2020 school year, and we were able to realize a surplus from our general operating budget that we were able to move into our fund balance. And so <laughs> while what we are proposing tonight is to use those funds that we experienced as a surplus to help fund this bonus for our employees, not this year's current operating budget. We are continuing to be conservative with our general operating budget until we get out of this period where we have the federal assistance that's helping us right now and we have a better picture of where we're going to land. So we'll continue to be conservative, but we're able to use the surplus from our 1920 year to fund this so that it doesn't impact our current operating budget. So with the proposal, full-time contract employees would receive a one-time $750 bonus. There are approximately 1,300 full-time contract employees, and the bonuses would be paid out on the October 29th pay period. Temporary and part-time employees paid from timesheets will receive a one-time $350 bonus once they have worked the equivalent of 10 days or 75 hours between July 1st and October 1st to also be paid out on October 29th. For those temporary and part-time employees who have not worked the qualifying hours by October 1st, there will be another opportunity for them to accumulate the required hours um, from uh, through December 1st. The payout for those uh, the payout date for those employee bonuses would be December 15th if they meet the 10 days or 75 hours. There are approximately 200 temporary and part-time employees. The cost of the one-time hard work pays off bonus is estimated to be at $1.3 million, which includes related fringe benefits, and will be funded from the savings that were realized from the 1920 general fund operating budget. Total unassigned savings realized and added to the general fund fund balance for the fiscal year that ended June 30th, 2020, totaled $1.98 million. After funding this one-time employee bonus, there would still be a remaining balance of $680,000 from, uh, from 1920 to leave in the fund balance to help with transitioning from ESSER funds when they end in September 2024. The general fund balance after designating the 1.3 million for bonuses would total 11.4 million dollars in unassigned or available funds before closing June 30th, 2021. Questions for Mr. Price? Very clear and well presented. I appreciate that. And the administration recommends approval of a bonus payment of $750 full-time contract employees and $350 to temporary employees. The bonus payments and related fringe benefits will be funded by the general fund balance. 
Do I hear a motion for approval? Second. Second. It's been properly moved and seconded that we approve the hard work pays off employee bonus. Is there any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? No. It's been approved. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Mr. Price. Thank you. <laughs> the next action item is revision to policy IHA, the grading system. Ms. Lindsay Ann Thompson. Good evening again. Um, as with most of our policies, there is a large group of folks who, who work on this and, and do a lot of research and legwork, and I get to be the mouthpiece for it. So, um, in particular, with the first two policies, IHA and IGCC, these are um, directly coming out of um, the instructional team, and, and they put together a lot of work to make sure that, that these policies were where they needed to be. Um, so the first one is IHA, grading slash assessment systems. And we're bringing this one um, to you for revisions because uh, the State Department noted in our application, um, our 21-22 our district proficiency-based system plan evaluation that we had not fully updated our policy IHA to the statewide um, grading, grading policy that was passed in 2019. Our policy was not at all um, in conflict with the state policy. We just didn't have everything listed in it and the State Department wanted us to have more. So what we've ended up doing is taking the model policy from the School Boards Association and merging uh, some of the language from our former policy IHA to, to have a, a new um, kind of comprehensive policy. So. So what's underlined um, has been added to the model policy, but most of what's underlined came from our original policy. Back there is mine. Um, but in any case, there's there's nothing in here that is um, uh, there's there's only a few things, excuse me, that are that are new practices. We've been um, practicing the same rules that the state has been using since 2019. We just didn't have all of them written in our policy. So we've gone from a two-page policy to a seven or eight page policy now. So um, I'm, I'm happy to, to answer or to field any questions about the specific changes, um, but uh, they're, they're there and, and, and you can. We've had a chance to look it over. Are there any questions from Ms. Thompson? The administration recommends first reading approval of revisions to policy IHA, the grading system as presented. Do I hear a motion for approval? So moved. Second. And properly moved and seconded. Do we approve the revisions? Is there any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed no? It's been approved. Thank you. Uh, the next policy I have is IGCC Honors Program, and this one works in tandem with our grading and assessment systems. Um, we had to add to be in compliance. Um, again, we weren't in conflict with the state grading policy, state uniform grading policy, but um, we did not have this wording in there. And it's very simple. Um, you cannot use PE1 or any course that can be substituted for PE1 to receive honors weight. So um, fairly straightforward, simple addition, but um, that is something that the state asked us to make sure we had in there. Any questions on that? The administration recommends first reading approval of IGCC. Is there any further discussion? Or do I hear a motion to approve? Second. It's been properly moved and seconded. Is there any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed, no. It's been approved. And remember, these are all first reading, so if you have any concerns, you can bring them up before second. Policy GA, district staffing plan. Okay, so this plan also prompted by um, moves from the State Department, um, and this one working both with the instructional and the personnel sides, um, trying, to, trying to merge the needs of, of both of those units. Uh, for the district staffing plan, what we've learned is that um, the Title I office is, um, feels that our um, low class sizes do not show that we have listed in policy and in administrative rule GA-R um, that we have in writing, do not show that in writing we need Title I teachers funded through our Title I plan. So they are saying that because our numbers are, are so, um, so small and that that's something that Georgetown County has always worked towards is having small teacher to student ratios, um, 
but it doesn't look like on paper we have a need for the Title I funding that we've requested. So when you go through and you look at what we've asked to do, we've asked to rescind policy GA-R, which is where we've listed our student to teacher ratios that are much lower than the state numbers. We have no intention of not abiding by these same low numbers, but what we'd like to do is kind of revise the way that it comes to you. I'm not aware of any other districts in a quick search um, of, of districts that have their actual um, class sizes and teach, student teacher ratios listed in policy or administrative rule. What I think most districts do, and is according to, to what the research we've been able to figure out, is not that it's listed in policy or administrative rule, but that it's brought to the board annually for a discussion item or an information item, um, rather than having to set the policy aside, which we've had to do a few years in a row now when we weren't able to quite make those low numbers, um, it would just be a, a more fluid number that would come to you on an annual basis rather than having it in policy. So policy GA, um, we have changed the wording so it more accurately reflects what the state regulations are, um, and, and that's that the state regs are going to decide what our student to teacher ratios are, and that we can go below those numbers, we just can't go above those numbers. Um, and the plan, of course, is to stay below those numbers at all times, um, as, as Georgetown County has always been very committed to doing. Um, and then it would be a full removal of GA-R uh, to, to take those numbers out of administrative rule and to bring them to you um, in the spring during budget development to have a, a better teacher allocation number to go for you. And I believe I've summed that up on behalf of the team, but I am happy to, answer, to, to, to throw that back to any of my, my teammates as well. The only question I would have was, do they have nothing better to do in Columbia than look at stuff like this? <laughs> I know you can't answer that. <laughs> okay, Mr. Dunham, um, where are we, and I'm just asking this rhetorical question here, perhaps we can get some answers. Um, where are we with class size? You know, especially with, with kindergarten, those formative years, you know, where are we right now? And Ms. Thompson, I'm not asking you, I'm asking to perhaps defer to someone else. Thank you. Mr. Mr. Jenkins may be able to give a ratio off the top of his head, but as you recall, we're using our ESSER funds right now to maintain employees. Even though our student enrollment is down, we are still maintaining the employees that we have, which should mean a low student-teacher ratio. Mr. Jenkins may be able to give more specifics. At the kindergarten level, we try to max out at 25 to 1. We have several individuals that are below that, but the maximum is 25 to 1 but most of them will probably be around the 20, 18, 19 range. For the elementary, middle, and high, we try to use the 21 to one ratio. I've never been a kindergarten teacher, and, 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 um, but I visited many kindergarten classes of 25 students. Um, that's, a, that's a lot of students in, in kindergarten. Yep, yep. Let's go back to Columbia. Um, all right. Any other questions? I do yes, have a question. Yes, ma'am. I guess I, I understand where we are with taking the numbers away. However, I want us to be absolutely positive that we're going to get numbers for allocations. They can't be numbers here and numbers somewhere else. And that's usually done beginning in January and February and goes all the way into the springtime. So before we start looking at teacher allocations, will we be able to get a number, not based on a budget, but on what we're looking at as a district and as a board to say, this is what we want to see in these classrooms because that's a concern. And, and, and we knew that that would be a concern, and so uh, Mr. Jenkins and Ms. Smith are, are both well prepared to, to answer that in a very concise and Thank you for your vote of confidence. <laughs> well prepared. Um, Ms. Smith and I talked this morning, and Ms. Johnson and I talked this morning. We are looking at the possibility of revising the budget calendar, and you are correct about the January to February. So we'll be looking at the 45th day, the 90th day, and looking at the enrollment that we have there to determine based upon the allocations how many each location would need. Uh, we are looking more for it to be a fluid document versus something that is static. 
So an appeal to Georgetown County for our recruitment purposes, for our parental involvement, and for test scores is trying to retain those small class sizes. So we're not lower than that ratio. Um, the main reason why we are asking, of course, is, is the Title I aspect. But as you know, every year, funding and enrollment can change. And we need to have the ability and the fluidity to be able to address those needs. But of course, we would not make any of those decisions without full disclosure to you first. That's just a real concern, because we have worked very diligently with the small numbers. And, and our budget can't it is driven somewhat yes. by those numbers so thank you any other <laughs> questions just as a follow-up this panel is assigned can we get some data perhaps at the next meeting to to see how many students are enrolled i'm particularly concerned about the elementary school because as we all know you know the, the students took a hard hit last year you know, academically, we all know that. Mm -hmm. and, and I'd like to see where we are as far as the numbers are concerned. You know. uh, I, I would agree. I, I'm, I'm concerned, you know, as we get ready to kick off our virtual program, some of the schools are being impacted by dissolving <coughs> three, one to three classes. I don't know if there's any more than three classes that are being dissolved in one school. But, the, you know, I, I was visiting one school and it was impacting first grade with adding eight more students in each of the first grade classrooms. The administration recommends first reading approval of revisions to policy GA district staffing plan as presented. Do I hear a motion for approval? It's been properly moved and seconded that we approve the recommended first reading. Is there any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed, no. Agreed. <coughs> administration also recommends that we repeal Administrative Rule GA-R, School District Staffing Formula, as presented. I hear a motion for approval. Second. We're properly moved and seconded that we approve the uh, repeal. Is there any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed, no. It's been approved. Thank you very much, Ms. Thompson, Ms. Smith, Mr. Jenkins. Thank you. The next action item is an application for homeschool option one, Dr. Bethany Giles. Good evening, Chairman Dunn, members of the board, Mr. Price, district administration, and guests. This evening, we present a completed homeschool option one application for approval that our team has reviewed. Just for informational purposes, um, I will share with you that there are three options that parents have in terms of homeschool that's under our state law. Option one allows the parents or guardian to homeschool their children under the supports of the school district if approved by our school district. Parents must complete the application and provide the following support documents. These include the proof of high school diploma or GED, provide proof of a baccalaureate degree, instructional calendar including 180 dates of instruction clearly defined, a written description of the location where in instruction will be generally held, a written description of the homeschool curriculum and lesson plans including textbooks, instructional materials on required subjects, a written description of how the parent or guardian will complete homeschool academic requirements, including a weekly schedule of instruction in each course, specific assignments, and textbook usage, a written description of how the academic program will be evaluated and what methods used to evaluate student progress, a written description of provisions for makeup work, and a written description of how student records will be maintained. 
Again, the board must review and approve all applications for homeschool option one before a student may withdraw from their school or begin homeschooling. So I present to you tonight one application that we have received, we've reviewed, and it is our recommendation that it be approved. Um, again, just for information purposes, as I stated, there are three options. Option two, under that option, parents may homeschool their children with the support of the South Carolina Association of Independent Homeschools. And under option three, again, parents may choose a homeschool association with no fewer than 50 members and it meets the homeschool requirements. So this is an option for, or an approval request for option one. I appreciated very much your thorough explanation in our packet of those three options. Yes, sir. It was very clear and precise, and uh, I had never known a lot of that before, so thank you for that. Thank you. Any other questions for Dr. Giles? The administration recommends approval of a student's homeschooling application for option one pursuant to South Carolina Code 59-75-40. Do I hear a motion for approval? It's been properly moved and seconded. We approve the application for homeschool option one. Is there any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed, no. It's been approved. Thank you very much, Dr. Giles. The last action item is a resolution of our school district's board of trustees urging the South Carolina General Assembly to repeal 2021-2022 budget proviso 1.108. As everybody knows, um, there's been a huge discussion of masking and mask mandates in our school districts. The Supreme Court has upheld the proviso that was in the, uh, the budget. Um, I wrote a personal letter to the governor asking him to reconsider his position, but of course that was rejected. I knew I was wasting 51 cents of the district's money, and I'll be happy to reimburse that 51 cents. <clears throat> but the South Carolina School Board Association is asking each school district to pass a resolution encouraging the school, the uh, legislature, to return to repeal that proviso. So I would like to recommend that our board adopt a resolution, and you've all had a chance to look it over, urging the South Carolina General Assembly to repeal 2021-2022 budget proviso 1.108 as presented. Do I hear a motion to approve? Second. Second. And properly moved and seconded. If we approve the resolution, is there any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? No. It's been approved. Maybe this won't be a total waste of uh, time, but hopefully it might have some impact. Now is the time for any board, superintendent, comments, or requests. Anybody at all? Grace. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good evening, everyone, ladies and gentlemen of the board. Thank you for your support of the two additional incentives that were approved earlier tonight that are in response to our continuing battle with the challenges caused by COVID-19. While our quarantine numbers are still higher than I would like, they are much lower than they were when we met two weeks ago. I believe this is a result of the hard work by all of our employees who were trying to create the safest learning environment possible. With that said, we must remain vigilant and intentional with our efforts. And the more students and employees who are eligible for vaccination get vaccinated and masks will result in more people being safer and more people allowed to attend school in person based on the current guidance that we have from DDAT. Our virtual program application period closed last week and our team began notifying parents of their application status earlier today. Teachers moving into our virtual program have also been notified and have begun preparations. As a result, some student schedules are having to be adjusted as a result of these shifts. 
and we ask for everyone who is impacted to please be patient as our principals work to navigate through these changes and provide notification. Our virtual program is set to launch on October 4th with two classes per grade level in grades kindergarten through six. And finally, congratulations to Waccamaw Middle student Brianna Gaspardo, who, the, who won the mascot art contest for the Charleston office of NAMI, the National Alliance on Mental Illness. Brianna's winning artwork will be featured by NAMI moving forward. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Price. All right, we do need an executive session this evening for the discussion of the superintendent's evaluation. Do I hear a motion to go into executive session for that purpose? So moved. Been properly moved and seconded that we go into executive session, <coughs> excuse me, for the discussion of the superintendent's evaluation. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed, no. We are now in executive session. Thank you. Motion to come out of executive session. So moved. Second. And properly moved and seconded. We come out of executive session. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed, no. We are now out of executive session. As a result of what we learned in executive session, is there a motion to be made? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, after reviewing Mr. Price's report on the district's progress summary presented to the board, and considering the board members' comments regarding Mr. Price's performance, I move that we conclude as a board that Mr. Price receive an overall excellent evaluation for the 2020-2021 school year. As a result of Mr. Price's overall excellent evaluation, I move that we extend his contract by one year through June 30, 2025, and that his salary be increased by $8,000, effective July 1st, 2021. Hard work pays off. Is there a second and a motion? Second. It's been properly moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed, no. It has been approved. Congratulations, Mr. Price. Carry on. This meeting is 